May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord. Amen. Please be seated. All right. A little American history trivia for y'all this morning. Who was the, the expedition leader for the first ascent of Denali, the highest peak in North America? Yeah, okay. You see where this is going, right? Yeah. Let me give you a hint. Uh, he worshipped here at St. Mark's, San Marcus, in 1888. All right. He was, uh, go he went to divinity school at Sewanee and was ordained a priest in the Diocese of West Texas by Bishop Steptoe Johnson. Uh, he went on to be the rector in Cuero and then the dean of the cathedral in Dallas. And then finally, he became the archdeacon of the Yukon for the Diocese of Alaska until he died in the 1920s. His name was Hudson Stuck. That's a picture of him from, from Sewanee. And in a time when explorers were either millionaires or backed by millionaires, this poor, scrawny clergy person in his early 50s was the most unlikely person to conquer or to ascend one of the world's tallest peaks. And yet, this is God's modus operandi, right? This is the way God works. God sees into the heart of a person, not their outward appearance, not their worldly skill set, but their hearts and their relationship with God. And if you don't believe me, ask Samuel. All right, Xander, let's go back to our, our first Samuel reading, the Old Testament reading this morning. So our Old Testament reading is from the first book of Samuel, and it starts at the end of chapter 15, when King Saul and the prophet Samuel have their big breakup. Back in chapter 9, and this is a wonderful love affair because Saul is, is Samuel's ideal candidate to be the first king of Israel. We hear in chapter 9 about how Saul was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. He was a handsome young lad. He came from a wealthy Benjaminite family, right? On paper, Saul was the best candidate for the job. And he certainly passed the eye test. Only Saul was not the best candidate for the job. Numerous times, he ignored God. Saul thought he knew better than God. And finally, in chapter 15, he did it one too many times, and God told Samuel, I'm done with this schmuck. No more. Oh, by the way, you got to go tell him I'm going to anoint somebody else. And so here we pick up. Samuel has just told Saul, God's going to anoint somebody else, and then kind of runs away. They go their separate ways. And then we start into chapter 16. And we get this sense that God is going to take a little bit more of a hands-on approach in anointing the next king. God is going to, to judge according to God's standards. Not to Samuel's standards, not to the people's standards, but to God's standards. And this is a bit of a surprise. The first surprise is that God sends Samuel to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, right, from the tribe of Judah, the smallest tribe in the nation of Israel. But it gets even more scandalous, all right? Jesse's grandmother was a Moabite. She was outsider. She was a foreigner. You might have heard of her. Her name was Ruth, as in Ruth and Naomi. Ruth and Boaz, the book of Ruth. So here we have the next great king of Israel coming from the smallest tribe 
and a family of a mixed background. And y'all, this is like Bridgerton level drama, right? And it gets worse, right? It gets worse because we get that uh, Samuel's gonna have all of Jesse's sons parade in front of him. And we feel like God is trying to make a point here, right? Because here comes Eliab, right? The first son, and again, he looks the part. He's big, he's a strapping young lad, and Saul is like, oh yeah, this is gonna work out. And God's like, no, 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 not so fast. God sees with the heart, not with the outward appearances. God judges according to a person's relationship with God, not their worldly skill set. And so it goes right down the line, right? Seven more of them. Nope, 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 nope. It feels like God is, is really driving this point home. Here were presumably good candidates, right? They would make good military or civil leaders for Israel. And God is like, none of them. Finally, Samuel has to ask, is there anybody else? And Jesse's like, oh yeah, we got the little one out in the field watching the sheep. David comes in, and God is like, that one. Samuel, totally bamboozled, right? He's trying to find the next great king of Israel, and all God cares about is whether or not this anointed one will be a good shepherd. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Right? And so, to Samuel's credit, he anoints David, and we go on with one of the greatest monarchy dramas of all time. But this story, right, the story is bigger than Saul or David or even Bathsheba and Absalom, Absalom. Because this is also the story of the Messiah. Ruth is also part of Jesus' family tree. And we see God set in motion this pattern of judging people according to their hearts and not their outward appearances. And it plays out over and over and over again. Fast forward a thousand years, 14 generations were told, and the Jewish people are looking for another messianic leader. Like David, they are looking for someone who can provide freedom and flourishing. And like Samuel, the people of first century Palestine were looking for a great military leader, someone who could oust the Romans and restore the temple to glory. Only that's not who God sends. God sends a good shepherd a pastoral pacifist who does away with temple worship altogether. God cares more about a person's heart, their relationship with God, than their outward appearance or their worldly skills. And so it goes, friends, right? We got the, the disciples. You know, some of the folks that penned the first Gospels, they were illiterate fishermen, not the best candidates on paper. Paul, right? What was Paul's name before it was Paul? Oh, yeah. Saul was a persecutor of the church, and yet he was chosen to bring the word to the Gentiles. Who, by the way, the first Gentile, was the centurion, a Roman centurion, welcomed into the faith. Didn't see that one coming, right? And so it goes, right? We think of uh, St. Francis of Assisi was a spoiled little rich boy. Right? Joan of Arc was a silly little girl, and, <laughs> and Hudson Stuck was an over-the-hill, poor clergy person whose only claim to anything was that he had a big heart. Unlike Edward Wimper, who was the first person to climb the Matterhorn, or even Roald Unmanson and, uh, and Ernest, Ernest Shackelford, right? the folks racing for the South Pole, they used those, those positions, those accomplishments, to kind of further their glory. But Hudson stuck. Hudson stuck, wrote books, and went on speaking tour to help support the missions to the native Alaskans. He used his fame 
to send First Nation young adults to medical school and to Sewanee for divinity school. Right? God sees into a person's heart, judges according to their relationship with God. And so here we are, again, a couple of thousand years removed, right? searching for leaders in our midst. Right? And so we should spend some time mulling over what God finds important in people, in leaders, in fathers, and all sorts of folks that we ask to step into roles of responsibility. Because God cares most about their heart, about their husbandry, in that classic agrarian sense, right? Their ability to shepherd, to nourish life and their relationship with God. With those qualities, we can climb any mountain.